Speaking professionally, I went out and asked other speakers, what do they do? What are their secrets to uh, success? And one of the things that I heard time and time again was that I had to be funny. So I've practiced a little joke for you tonight. <laughs> See, they're already laughing. So there's this rope that walks into the bar, sits down. Oh, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me start over again. There's this rope that's tied up in a knot. And he's got these frayed edges on the top of his head. He walks into the bar and sits down. And the bartender says to him, hey, aren't you that frayed knot that I kicked out last week? Oh, darn, I did it again. I gave away the punchline. <laughs> Now, I don't know what you observe sitting there, but from where I stand, that's not me. Telling jokes and forcing myself to be funny is not who I naturally am. Sure, there's been times where a whole room full of people have laughed at something I've said, but it's typically been pretty uh, spontaneous. But how much of our lives are we living where we're living according to what other people tell us we have to be? And I know some of you are doing this every single day, and I know because I've done it myself, where you go to work every day to a job that doesn't inspire you, and you're working with people that you don't really have a lot in common with, maybe serving clients and customers that don't value your efforts, and doing a job that does not really give you the opportunity to use your natural talents. Now, some people actually live their whole life like this, not really living their true self. And I was looking for an example that I could share with you, and I found something in a book called Babbitt by Sinclair Lewis. And the story is about um, conformity, living in society according to everyone else's rules and values. And the last page of the book, after he tried and tried and tried to break free from this conformity and failed miserably and came back to his normal life, he says, I've never done a single thing I've wanted to in my whole life. Now about 15 years ago, my mom passed away. And I never really knew her until then. She had breast cancer and she was sick for about nine years and I never really understood the pain that she went through and I'm not talking about the pain of the surgery or the chemo or the cancer. I'm talking about the pain that she endured I think her whole life where she was never really able to be her true self. So in that last year of her life, she decided that she was going to finally do something that she wanted to do and that was to write. And she wasn't well enough to write a whole book. And she wanted to tell her story. So she decided to invite all her family members to contribute to the book. And she came from a fairly large family. She was the 11th child, a French-Canadian family here from St. Boniface. And so everyone was invited. There were no rules except that it had to be in English, which for them was a bit of a stretch. But I was helping her write it. I was actually typing it up. At that time, as many of you know, there were no laptops or home computers. Most of us didn't have them. And so a lot of the stories were written out in script, and so I had typed them for her. And I collected them over a period of several months, and I put them in a binder. I'll always remember something that I saw in her when I handed her that book was something I had never, ever seen before in my life. And I think what it was, was her seeing her reflection of her real, true self for the first time. Now back then I didn't really understand what that was all about. I, I figured something was going on, but I didn't know what it was. And the reason is I hadn't figured it out for myself either. It took me about a decade to get there. And it was because of something I went through in my own personal life that was very similar to hers. That I realized I had been living my life according to everyone else's beliefs and values and what they thought I should be doing. 
And so I went through a period of uh, transition and transformation about five years ago. And it was a really tough time and I'm trying to find words to describe it. And I did find something that I think might help. For me at least, it provided some sort of stability to this massive transformation I went through. And there's a fellow by the name of Joseph Campbell. Now he's passed away, but he spoke about something called a hero's journey, where this happens across many cultures over time, where an individual goes through a transformation to find their true self, and they come out on the other side and they give back to community. And so this is something that I think my mom innately knew, I don't know whether she did or not, but she did it in her final days. I'm lucky to say that I was, I'm younger than her, so I have a, a lot more years to do this with. And what I found in that period of time was I was able to define what it was I really wanted in my life and start to live by that. And when I do that, I really feel great. I feel good. I feel in balance. I feel symmetrical, you know, the body and the brain, they really, really seek this congruency between what you're doing and what you really want to do. And some of you in this room may know what I'm saying. When you're not doing that, you get this knot, and you might even feel a little bit frayed. <laughs> and we put labels on this, and we call it things like angst and anger and, and anxiety and stress and depression. And what we do is, and that's good, because now we have a label that we can now fix. We can throw stuff at it, you know, get the book out and get the therapy out and maybe some medication out, and we just try and fix the label instead of fixing what's deep inside. And I think personally that's where the real change comes from. Now, I'm not going to assume that everyone's going to be going through the same thing I am, but I'm guessing that some of you in the room have lived a real true self-life your whole life. And you may still continue to do that. And every day you get up and you know exactly what you want to do. And you go to work and you have relationships and everything's great. And I think there's some people in the audience who have gone through a transformation and you've evolved and you've emerged and you're energized and motivated. And you get up every day and you know what you want to do. And a lot of you are the stories that we've been hearing about these last few years. People are coming out to tell their stories. And I suspect there's some people in the audience who are on the verge of going through this transformation. And um, if you decide that that's the way you want to go, I want to tell you something. It's, it can be painful. It's maybe not so easy. I'm reminded of the pain of this uh, by a quote from one of my favorite writers, Anais Nin. And the day came when the risk to remain tight in a bud was more painful than the risk it took to blossom. So as I went through this pain in my life and discovered some, t some tools to actually stabilize what was happening, I, I like to call that my I. And I, for me, is, is all, well, it's all about me, right? <laughs> After you're going through a transformation, it really should be all about you. But it's also the first letter in the word intention. And when I started to understand this notion of knowing my intention, it provided me with some stability in terms of what I do every day and what I, when I get up every morning. So I wanted to share with you three of my favorite intentions. I have many different intentions, as you all do as well, and they change depending on the context and the people in your life. And so I want to share with you three of them. The first is um, I, I want to give back to my community. So that's part of my intention of going through this transformation. And so. What I do to do that is I share openly and freely as much as possible the knowledge that I've learned in my life to whoever will listen, <laughs> including you all. The best way for me to describe that other second intention are words that June Colwood said in her last interview before she died. He asked her two questions in the latter part of the interview and they were, what comes next and do you believe in God? And she didn't negate his question, but how she answered it resonated to me so deeply at that time in my life. And she said, I believe in kindness. And she said, it's those little acts of kindness that we do, even just opening the door for the person behind you, which 
insinuates that you're actually paying attention to what's going on behind you. And you're outside of your own world for a brief moment. And by doing that and helping another person, you're actually shifting something tiny in them that vibrates through our planet. And you're actually helping to change the world. And my third intention is, I like to say, at the very highest level for me. This is what gets me up every morning. It's what I think about when I go to bed at night. And any time I'm wondering and getting into the knot and wondering, what am I doing here? This is what gets me going, and it's love. And I think about love in a loop. And it's loving myself and loving others. So for those of you in the room that might be thinking about this journey, this hero's journey, where you want to transition through, think about it. Consider it. It's, it's worth it. And what you might find is you might discover what you really, really want to do in your life. And you might then articulate and find your why, what will keep you going, get you, getting you out of bed every morning. And whether it's the job you have or a new job, you can reframe it, whether you change your intention or change what you're doing that meets that intention, right? Like Debbie said, it's how you look at the situation, not the situation itself. And when you do that, when you know what you want and you have clear intentions, you can live a life where you can truly be yourself.